Hi, my name is Kelly Smith. I'm in Sparks, Nevada. And I've come to you today to make a video. This is actually redo, a second version of a video I did a couple days ago. I wasn't happy with the outcome. I, something went a little bit wrong, so I wanted to redo this and send a better message to this. And so I'm here to, to make amends for that. <clears throat> this is all about the message of the Liahona. And a, and a profound lesson I learned about 35 years ago uh, from the Lord. He taught me this very profound principle. And I think it has great relevance for us today in the church, especially with all the things that are happening right now. And so with that, I'd like to uh, kind of diagram how this all works. And hopefully, I pray the Spirit of the Lord will be with me, that this will help you in your life, with your family and everything in the, in the church as a whole. You know, the uh, Liahon is a, an amazing thing. It's one of the very first things taught in the Book of Mormon. And we're going to go into great detail. And, I, and I've taught this a lot of times, seminary and gospel doctrine classes, and I always have somebody come up, hey, would somebody come up and, and draw what you think the inside of the Liahona looks like? I don't care about the outside. I just want to know what the inside looks like, you know, how it all works. And so I get a lot of different responses, and most of them are along, <coughs> along this line. I have a spindle, a pointer going one way, and a pointer going the other way, on a plane, and a... I don't like this. They put some kind of pointer on the top and the bottom. Like I said, I don't care about the, the outside, just the inside. Something like that. And, you know, a lot of different versions of that, right? So I always ask them, you know, let's, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at the verse. Let's look at First Nephi chapter 16, verse 10. And let's read where the, the introduction to it. And it says... <clears throat> It came to pass as my father rose in the morning, and he went forth to the tent door. To his great astonishment, he beheld upon the ground a round ball of curious workmanship. And it was of fine brass, and within the ball were two spindles, and the one pointed the way whither we should go in the wilderness. I always ask the class, now if the one pointed the way whither we should go in the wilderness, what did the other one do? And nobody has a good answer. I've never had a good answer to that. So we continue reading, and I'm not going to read a reverse, uh, but... You know, we go through this whole experience. They traveled in the wilderness, one of the more fertile parts of the wilderness. And then Nephi breaks his bow. Causes a great problem. Everybody's starving to death. Remember, this is, it's not like not being able to go to the grocery store. I mean, if you're going to eat something, you've got to go out and kill it. And now they lost their means. They lost the bow. I mean, this was a very, very difficult time. If you had to go out and kill something from something that you made, you know, not a high-powered hunting rifle or a compound bow or anything like that, something you made. It's a very tough thing, okay? And so the, his brethren are angry, and uh, his father, Lehi, becomes angry. And he actually loses a little bit of standing with the Lord. This is the only time in all of the Book of Mormon we have Lehi being you know, angry and upset. And so things began to be exceedingly difficult in 21. Nephi goes and takes, makes out of a wood a bow and out of a straight stick an arrow. He'd arm himself and he went to his father, whither shall I go to obtain food? What a profound example of faith. He did what he could when he knew how to do, and then he says, whither shall I go to obtain food? And they did inquire of the Lord, and the voice of the father, you know, murmured against him, and the Lord said, look upon the ball. And it came to pass, they, they saw that it was written, and they did fear and tremble exceedingly. Verse 27. Now, notice verse 28. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the pointers which were in the ball, and that they did work according to the faith and diligence and heed which we did give unto them. And there was also written upon them a new writing, which was plain to be read, which did give us understanding concerning the ways of the Lord. And it was written and changed from time to time according to the faith and diligence which we gave unto it. And thus we can see that by small means... The Lord can bring about great things. Now, after reading that in the class, I always ask them, I said, do you want to change this design at all? They look at me and, uh, why? I said, well, what did it say? Right? Now, let's be very clear here. It showed that there were two spindles and two pointers. Right? There's two of them, not just one. And also notice that it was written upon them a new writing. So there has to be some kind of a surface area around this pointer. There can be writing written 
on the surface of the earth, written upon them. Okay, so now again I ask the question. If one pointed the way with you should go to the wilderness, what did the other one do? And everybody's usually perplexed. They still don't know. And so I tell them, let's do this. Let's reread verse 10, and I'm going to change it slightly. I know it's a great sin to add and take away from the scripture, but I'm using Nephi's words, and this is what the Lord showed me 35 years ago. <clears> they <throat> upon the ground a round ball of curious workmanship, and it was of fine brass. And within the ball were two spindles. And when we did exercise our faith and diligence and heed, the pointers did work together as one, pointing the way whether we should go in the wilderness. Isn't that cool? So the pointers when they were working as one, pointed the same direction. One way, they'd show them, they'd know exactly, there's no dispute, there's no mistake. They know exactly which way to go. And when they weren't working as one, then they did this, or this, or that, or something. You know, we don't know what happened. They weren't pointing the same direction. So let's draw what that looks like. We have the plane here, we have two spindles. We have two pointers going in the same direction. They're both pointing the same way, right? They did work together as one. They were unified. Now let's talk about this profound principle. Again, shown very early in the Book of Mormon that they were as one. How can we be as one? So there's a couple of different things. Number one is with ourselves. When we are one with God, we progress. When we're following his will, submitting to him, we're doing all these things, we progress in our life. We progress in every way, both mentally, spiritually, financially, socially, everything. We're progressing. Because remember when they, Lehi and them, they, the Alma tells us that they did wander in the wilderness. They did not give heed to this. They weren't as one, and that's what caused them to wander. Maybe you're wandering in your life right now. Maybe you're not as one with God as you need to be. I found that in my life. That's what's happened to me many times. Wandered for years. Okay, so that's another one. How about families? And, you know, being one as a family is a, is a tough challenge, right? You've got more people to deal with and a lot of different things dealing with. So, like for an example, now if a, a husband says, we need to do this, and a wife says, we need to do that, then they're not as one, so they don't progress. It's contention, arguments. One always, you know, kind of one up in the other and, trying to be the best and stuff, and the children don't progress the way they should. And again, we wander as a family through the wilderness, maybe for years. How about as a ward? When a ward is unified as one, it progresses as a ward. People do service. They feel loved. They feel cared for. They minister. They do missionary work. The ward kind of becomes like a little bit of Zion. And it progresses and moves forward as a ward. Right? And then there's the, you know, stake and the whole church is the same thing, right? They, when we are as one, we progress. I'm here to tell you that we as a church are not as one. What is the goal here. Zion is as one. We are not progressing as a church as one. It's my opinion. We're not acting as one. What's the, what's the damage? What, what's the cause of not being as one? Well, you know, in the pre-mortal life, Satan stood up and said, you know, I have a better idea. Um, Heavenly Father, listen, you've got all the power needed to save all these people. 
We don't have to lose anyone. Now, I understand. You can't go down there and die and be resurrected. You, you're already there, right? So I'll go down. I'll go down and do that. But you have to give me my, your power. And therefore, we won't lose all these people because you have the power to save all these people. And the Lord said, no. And what did he do? He rallied everybody around him. No, this is not fair. He's not being fair to us. And that he has the power to save all of us. A lot goes on here. But the point is, he stood up and said, I have a better way. And rounded everybody up and caused the war in heaven. The same is true today. There's a lot of people online that are speaking their mind, saying, I have a better way. I know what's best for the church. I know what we need to do. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do what the prophet says. We don't need to do what the apostle says. I know a better way. And so that is the main reason what's causing us this division, the disputations, the divisions. There's a lot going on in the, in the world right now. There's a lot going on in the church. You all know all about this. There are a lot of very vocal people that are speaking out against the prophets and apostles. The prophet and apostles are who we need to follow. Now there's one word that the world does not like. It's kind of required in order to follow them. And that word is submissive. There is no one in our culture that teaches us to be submissive. But that's what's required. It requires humility, putting down our pride, being submissive to God and his spokesperson, spokesman. We're not... When we're not submissive, we're acting like Satan. We're saying, I got a better way. Everybody needs to follow me. And they're gathering up all these people, saying, this, I have a better way. So that's the thing I'm hoping we can get rid of. That we, once we recognize what's happening here, then we can avoid the problems. We can become like Zion. We can become as one. We can become unified as a church. You see, Zion is the only way, it's the only thing that's going to spare us. It's going to save us from what's coming. We all have heard about the things that are coming. I've had my own dreams about it. I made my videos about it. A lot of other people have too. You know, the whole book of Revelation practically talks about what's coming. The book of Mormon talks about what's coming. The Doctrine and Covenants talks about what's coming. We know what's coming. And I'm here to tell you it's far worse than most people want to think about. And the only way we're going to be saved is Zion, the New Jerusalem. America is in very deep trouble right now. I mean, it's really, really bad. And you're not hearing about it. You're not, they're not talking about this. And I see all kinds of people going out and Spend all kinds of money and all kinds of things. I mean, they, they don't want to talk, think about horrible things coming. They want to just plan for the future. It's all going to be great and wonderful. They're not planning for Zion. And I'm telling you, I, I believe that's a mistake. And, you know, I'm, you got to do what you got to do. And uh, people, you know, the, the, one of the keys here is personal revelation. Now, here's one of the things that I think is really dangerous going on. I've seen people, more than one, talk about saying, listen, <clears throat> we believe in personal revelation. The prophet over there says something. If Jesus Christ tells me that that is correct, then I will follow that. You see what's wrong with that? That's false doctrine. Now, I'm, I know Joseph Smith and others talk about not following blindly the prophet. I'm not talking about that. Once we get a testimony that that prophet is the prophet of God, then, you know, we're kind of done. We don't have to test every word they say. We don't have to. We don't have to rehash it every time. Heavenly Father, is that correct? 
Heavenly Father, does this one know what I should do? And we don't do that. We don't need to do that. Now, some people are going to have a problem with something, and they're going to have, have to kind of work it over and pray about it. And, and again, if they're humble and submissive, they'll get an answer. But I've seen too many people say, well, what if he's wrong? We've had examples in history of prophets being wrong. Okay, let's talk about that. What if the prophet is wrong? I'm here to tell you that even if the prophet is wrong, if we follow him, we'll be blessed. That's true. And people wonder, oh, how, that, that can't be true. There's, there's no way in the world. The Lord allows all of us. Now, he will not lead us, allow a prophet to lead us astray. We know that. That's very clear. But we've had examples of things that have happened that didn't lead the whole church astray. Right? There's lots of examples of that. But the goal here is, if we will submit ourselves to our prophets, even if they're wrong, we'll be blessed because we are as one. And that's our goal, to submit ourselves, to be as one, as a church, as a family, as a war at a stake, one with ourselves, with God, so we can build up Zion. Zion is the goal here. But when we have people denigrate, demean, dismiss, ignore the words of the prophets and apostles, when they criticize the leadership, they are, in essence, like Satan in the pre-mortal life, saying, I got a better way. They don't know what they're doing. They are biased because of their past business life. They don't understand the things of the world. They're locked up in their ivory tower. They don't, under, you know, there's a whole bunch of things people do that criticize and demean them and thus their power. Now, here's the problem. As soon as somebody gets into this criticism mode, the spirit leaves. Without the spirit, you can't progress. We wander in the de desert for years. We're going to wander and wander forever. We don't have time to wander. The command to build Zion was one of the first commandments ever given in this dispensation. It's toward the very, very beginning. The command to build Zion. They didn't build it. Why? Because they weren't as one. They weren't unified. And a lot of people criticized Joseph Smith for a lot of things. He wasn't perfect. And they criticized Brigham Young. They criticized all the other prophets. They criticized Wolford Woodruff and everybody. Spencer Kimball, Ezra Taft Benson. They've all been criticized. President Nelson, right now, has faced an enormous amount of criticism for some of these decisions, the implementation of things regarding what's happening in our society today. I'm here to tell you, unless we submit to the Holy Spirit and to listen to them, not criticize them, and yes, if you have a problem, Pray about it to God and get your own testimony of it. But a lot of times I see people, they get real wound up. They've got these very deep personal beliefs. And they can't feel the Spirit because they're not being submissive. They know the answer, and all they want to do is confirm that they know the right answer. They don't want a different answer. So I'm hoping this will be of some benefit. I'm hoping that we as a church can become as one, that we can get direction, acting in the right way, knowing which way to go, so that we can build Zion. I'm hoping and praying that we can do that. That's what I want. I want Zion. Personally, I'm ready for it. I hope I'm ready for it. It's a lot bigger thing than most people realize. But that's what I want, is Zion, because it's the only thing that's going to save us from what's coming. I have a lot more thoughts regarding this, but I'm not going to put them in this video. But I'm here to tell you 
I think it's far more important to follow President Nelson's advice than most people realize. I think there are things he sees in the future that make it imperative that we follow his advice. That's all I'm going to say about that. I hope and pray this has been beneficial to you. I hope and pray that we can become Zion, that we can become as one, not criticize the leaders, become one as a church, submit ourselves to the prophet, even if he's wrong, and become a Zion people. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.